All right, it looks like we have a great group today. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to today's presentation titled, The Role of Families in SAMHSA's Office of Recovery, presented on behalf of the National Federation of Families and SAMHSA's Office of Recovery. There are a few housekeeping items I would like to go over quickly before we begin. This presentation is being recorded and the recording link slides and a letter of attendance will be sent to everyone who attended today. And this information will also be available on NASHBIDS and the Federation of Families websites. The chat pod is enabled for you to ask questions and or share information with the group if you would like. If you need closed captioning today, a link will be shared in the, in the chat pod, excuse me. After today's presentation ends, please stay connected to take a short survey and provide us some feedback about today's presentation. We would like to give spe special thanks to SAMHSA for sponsoring this presentation, and thank you again for joining us. I will now turn this over to Dr. Linda Gargan, Executive Director of the National Federation of Families. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Kelly, so much. And welcome to everyone who's joining us. Can you believe this panel we have for today? Now, in October of 2022, you folks probably know that SAMHSA opened the Office of Recovery. And they did this to ensure that the lived experience voice was included in all mental health and substance use policy, programs, and support. This panel represents the Office of Recovery, as most of you probably already know, and they will be discussing the roles of families. And that includes caregivers of children with serious mental illness and the roles of family peer specialists in the recovery journey and how SAMHSA is prioritizing this voice. I am not going to attempt to introduce these folks. I'm going to allow them to do it themselves because I cannot do justice to their resumes. These resumes are as incredible as the level of lived experience that we have on this panel today. So I am going to simply say that we are going to have some slides in the beginning, and then we will go into a very interactive uh, time to discuss your questions and to try our best to get as many of those answered as possible. And with that, I am going to turn this over to Paulo DeVecchio, who is the Director of the Office of Recovery. Thank you very much, Linda, and uh, welcome to everyone who's uh, joining us today. It's uh, wonderful. We have almost 300 people, at least uh, that I'm showing, um, that have joined us, which is uh, outstanding. Um, I am... Uh, We'll just spend a moment to introduce myself, um, and then I'll ask our my two other colleagues here to introduce themselves as we get started. So I am uh, uh, Paolo Del Vecchio. I'm the director of SAMHSA's new Office of Recovery. I am a person in long-term recovery from mental health addictions and trauma histories. I'm also a family member in that both, uh, I have both members of my immediate nuclear family who experience mental health and addiction issues. Um, and then I'm also a father of children who are uh, with living experience of, uh, of mental health issues as well. So um, I'm really uh, excited about the Office of Recovery, the opportunities um, that we have uh, both at the federal level, as this is the first time ever that we have a federal office of recovery, opportunities that we have to elevate the voice of people with lived experience, including family members in all aspects of the behavioral health field. So we're going to talk in more, much more detail about that. Um, I'll just note that um, I have uh, 28 years of experience now working at SAMHSA in different capacities. Um, previous to that, I worked for the City of Philadelphia in its Office of Mental Health, um, as well as nonprofits in the City of Brotherly Love as well. 
Um, so I am uh, excited to be joined by my colleagues here with wonderful expertise. We'll ask them to introduce themselves and then we'll get into the program. Donna? Thank you, Paulo. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Donna Dimitrovic. Um, I'm uh, uh, honored to be able to serve as a senior advisor in the Office of Recovery here at SAMHSA. Um, I am also a woman in long-term recovery. Uh, my recovery journey is spanned over 37 years of uh, continued abstinence from uh, alcohol and drugs. But most importantly, as I have gotten older, is um, you know I, I'm a grandmother of four, and I'm uh, helping my son uh, raise his kids, and you know affected by both mental health and substance use disorder, and so this. Um, is really near and dear to my heart. Um, my professional career has spanned, um, you know, just about as long as I've been in recovery. Uh, I've worked um, not only in local and state recovery community organizations, uh, primarily around addiction recovery, but I also had the opportunity to work uh, within a large healthcare system. I worked for uh, a managed care company for several years, so I got to see that aspect of uh, the payer side. Um, my journey here at SAMHSA started about three years ago as the director of the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, um, but my real um, passion lies in recovery and supporting not only folks you know, uh, in or seeking recovery, but also family members, kids, you know, grand grandkids. Um, so it really is an honor for me to be here today, and I want to thank you all for being here uh, at the at this presentation. And Liz, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Paulo. My name is Liz Sweet, and I am absolutely over the moon uh, about this presentation and the opportunity to uh, spend time with all of you. Um, this is like most of you, I think, can imagine. Um, working for Paolo in the Office of Recovery is nothing short of a, a dream job. And I'll share a little bit about myself, and that will help you understand um, why I say that. Uh, I came to this work um, out of, and I see that Christy Johnson is on with us. Um, hi, Christy. My home is in uh, North Dakota, and that's where Christy works as a support specialist. So. Um, my background is um, as a social worker working, uh, working in the world of disabilities. And then I became a drug and alcohol addiction counselor, worked there with women and children in uh, recovery for uh, about eight years in both a nonprofit setting and then for state government, and then moved over to children's mental health. And while working in um, the state system around children's mental health, um, got an opportunity to come and work at SAMHSA 25 years ago. And when I came to SAMHSA, uh, Paulo was in the Consumer Affairs Office. And I can tell you that for the 25 years I have been at SAMHSA, Paulo has been leading the way around making sure that every voice was heard. And there were no meetings um, held internally at SAMHSA that Paolo was responsible for that he didn't either personally come to my desk or email me and say, um, Liz, I'd really like for you to be at this meeting um, with me. And as Paolo developed that Office of Recovery, um, he offered up every opportunity for family voice whenever he could. Then as Paolo moved to the, uh, the center director's position, um, Paolo had an open door for everybody um, in, C in CMHS, but there was never a time when there were issues that families were having that they would call me and talk to me about that I ever had any hesitation about walking up the hall and um, knocking on Paolo's door and saying, have you got a minute? And Paolo never, ever in any of that time said, no, I'm too busy to hear about families. That just doesn't happen in Paolo's world. And so 
when uh, Paolo was named the director of the Office of Recovery, and he called me and said, um, I'd really like for you to come and work with me. I was like, what? <laughs> and um, and so now here I am um, almost five months later in this job that gives me the opportunity to make sure that Family Voice is embedded in all of the work that we do. And as Paolo says, Liz, I want you to bring your 25 years of experience from, um, from the Center for Mental Health Services working with families to the SAMHSA level working across all three centers. So now, folks, um, I get to bring your voice across all three centers and making sure that families and our concerns and caregivers and our concerns are heard at all of those tables. So um, I want to publicly say thank you, Paolo, for always remembering that um, kids aren't born without parents. Um, kids don't come into this world without a family. And Paolo has made sure that um, our voice is heard across all of our systems. So um, that's my background. And many of you I know, many of you I'm just beginning to uh, be introduced to, but I am looking forward to hearing all of the questions that folks have. So thank you, Linda. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and told all my, most of your remarks were about my bio, but appreciate that. Um, I do want to, uh, again, uh, we're up to almost 350 people keep watching the counter here, but um, more more the better because um, we need um, everyone's voice to make the changes that are needed. In our remarks this morning, we're gonna start with Donna providing a bit of history about SAMHSA's involvement as it relates to recovery. Then I'm gonna go next, I'm gonna talk about um, our present activities as it relates to the Office of Recovery. And then we're going to end our formal comments with Liz, putting a particular focus on our family um, activities and where we see family voice being elevated in this work. Before uh, I turn it to Donna, again, major shout out to Nashbid for their leadership in uh, helping to promote all things recovery, including family voice. Um, as well as to the Federation of Families for all their leadership and Linda in particular. Donna, please. Thank you, Paulo. Okay. So I just wanna uh, quickly go over our objectives for today's presentation. We're going to uh, uh, talk about SAMHSA's commitment to including the voice of families, of individuals experiencing challenges with mental health, substance use, serious mental illness and or serious emotional disturbances in dec decision making. Um, also understand the importance of family engagement to meet the Office of Recovery's goals. And then understand the role of family peer specialists as key supports for families of children across the lifespan with mental health and or substance use challenges. Next slide. So this disclaimer is just that the views, opinions, and content of our presentation are those of the producers and contributors and don't necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of SAMHSA or HHS. All of the material is public domain. Next slide, please. So what I'm gonna do today is just talk a little bit about the history of, of recovery at SAMHSA. Um, you know, and while we announced uh, and the Assistant Secretary announced the new Office of Recovery uh, last year. You know, SAMHSA has been involved in recovery initiatives for many, many, many years. Um, and I just wanna do a little bit of a brief history about it in case some of you are not aware of it. Um, and, you know, the other thing I think that's really important that SAMHSA has always included uh, people with lived experience um, and, you know, our whole Office of Recovery um, our staff all have lived experience of um, either addiction, substance use, or family experience. So in, in the 1970s, Adama uh, started the community support program. Um, and in the, in the 1980s, uh, we had uh, 
monthly conference call of consumers and ex-patient leaders. We sponsor the Alternatives Con Conference, which was held every year, uh, peer-operated services demonstrations, and then the Mental Health Block Grant and PAMI legislation uh, came about. We've also um, have sponsored Recovery Month, and I think we're at the 34th year maybe this year, uh, moving into Recovery Month. So we have a long history of supporting that. And Recovery Month is not only substance use recovery, but it's also mental health recovery. In the 1990s, uh, we, uh, SAMHSA uh, initiated the Recovery Community Services Program. I was lucky enough to be one of the first grantees when I was in Pennsylvania. And um, that was back in 1998. Uh, we also support the consumer and consumer supported TA centers, the state consumer networks. Uh, there was a Surgeon General's report on mental health that came out in the 1990s. Um, the first consumer affairs specialist was hired at SAMHSA, uh, the consumer operated services program, the CMHS NAC subcommittee on consumer and survivor issues was also initiated in the 1990s. Next slide, please. So in the 2000s, we saw the president's new freedom commission report, uh, CMS Medicaid funding for peer workers. Uh, we had the recovery to practice uh, that was initiated in the 2000s. We also had the Voice Awards uh, that was, um, you know, pretty prominent back in the 2000s. Uh, we also had a wellness campaign, and then both CMHS, the Center for Mental Health Services, and CSAT, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment uh, Services. Uh, those centers both had an Office of Consumer Affairs. In the 2010s, we had the Building Communities of Recovery Grant, better known as the B-Core Grant, um, and then Brass Tax, which I'm sure many of you um, uh, remember. And you know, personally, I think there's a wealth of information under Brass Tax, uh, as well as the recovery to practice around peer support and the value of that and how to implement that within um, not only organizations, but uh, other um, larger institutions that may be um, interested in providing peer recovery support services. Uh, we also had the recovery community uh, statewide program, uh, statewide network, um, which was released in, in the 2010s, and then the targeted capacity peer-to-peer -peer recovery grants that were available. We also, um, offered up the transforming lives being via supportive employment, and then funded the Peer Recovery Center of Excellence, um, which, you know, for those of you that, that are interested, we had a uh, report that was just updated on the Peer Recovery Center of Excellence website uh, that looks at all the peer uh, certifications across the country in each state, both mental health and substance use. So it's they really tried it, they updated that document for those of us that are interested in that. Um, you know, of course, in the 2020s with this, uh, with President Biden's administration, we announced the very first person in recovery as acting assistant secretary. Uh, many of you know him, Tom Cordaire, who is now the acting deputy um, assistant secretary. And then of course, you know, our exciting announcement of the Office of Recovery was announced um, first and foremost, I think one of them, uh, it, um, you know, it really has given us the opportunity to, to um, elevate recovery in a way that we have never been able to do before. Next slide, please. <clears throat> you know, we talk a lot about recovery and, you know, uh, over the years, and I've been involved like on the other side uh, not only as a person working here at SAMHSA, but also as a, as a community member and someone that was involved in community-based organizations. So I, I had the opportunity to, to be a part of a lot of these recovery summits and a lot of these meetings that I just want to bring up here. But, you know, we had recovery summits where, you know, they may have been um, people with lived experience, but it, it was a little bit siloed. So we had substance use conditions, and then folks with mental health conditions were really, you know, defining and establishing, establishing principles of recovery, but it was kind of like, um, you know, separate 
And, you know, I know I was involved in a lot that was, that was done, um, you know, specific to substance use disorders. But then over the years, as SAMHSA started to um, really build out recovery within the organization, um, we really try to bring together the commonalities. Um, and in 2010, there was a unified recovery summit that really identified uh, what we had in, uh, in common while also understanding there was unique and distinct uh, differences as well. So with the um, recovery definition, there was an open forum on SAMHSA's website, what website to really provide uh, an opportunity for public feedback and comment, comment uh, as we started to move that forward. Next slide, please. And this is the definition that came out of that unified meeting. It was a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. And to me, I think this is, um, you know, in, it, in my own personal story, this is, uh, you know, broad enough um, to really be unique to my own individual recovery. Um, and, you know, really talks about how we as people in recovery strive to really reach our full potential, no matter how um, or, or what our pathway may be to recovery. Next slide. Uh, this is just a slide to, you know, kind of reiterate SAMHSA's um, uh, commitment to recovery support services. We know that they're essential and it really does, uh, we really do want to advance recovery support systems. I'm sure Paula is going to talk about that uh, in a little while, but it, you know, we want to also promote not only involvement of people in recovery, but also families and caregivers and those that are uh, that are considered uh, loved ones of people in recovery uh, or seeking recovery. We know that recovery support services can be provided in various settings. So not only community-based organizations, maybe hospitals, um, you know, could be provided in health, in health settings, other health settings, um, but it's just not, um, we have seen the growth of that, I think, uh, over the last 20 years that to me is pretty amazing. Uh, recovery support services really help people enter and navigate systems of care, um, removing barriers to recovery, staying engaged in the recovery process, and helping people live their lives in the communities of their choice. And uh, isn't that what everybody wants, you know, to be able to live in the community of their choosing? And I think, you know, SAMHSA's um, four dimensions of recovery, home, health, purpose, and community really spell that out. Uh, we know there's a full range of support services, and we do um, believe that they are essential. And we also believe that the importance of um, peers providing that shared understanding, respect, and mutual empowerment really helps people in their journey of recovery. I know for me in my own personal recovery, being able to connect with somebody and see, um, see them kind of living a life of recovery provided me the hope and the belief in myself that I too could do uh, the same as they they were doing. Next slide. Uh, just um, you know what we've been doing recently uh, in in August of 2022, we had a national gathering, uh, and it was our first recovery summit that we held in uh, about 10 years. You know, and it was uh, a place where we wanted to bring together um, stakeholders from all across the country not only substance use, but mental health, families, researchers. So while we had a limited number of spots that were available, we also tried to make it as diverse as possible. So we had the voice of everyone at the table. And really the focus for that was to kind of review SAMHSA's definition, including the four definitions and principles. And then uh, listening to folks to hear about how you all operationalize that definition and how we can use that um, definition into specific strategies, looking at the Office of Recovery, uh, how can we uh, kind of focus on recovery all across uh, the work that we're doing, not, you know, throughout our centers and offices, but also across the federal government. And so the two themes that really came out of that recovery summit, one was, you know, advancing peer recovery support services, and then also systems transformation. Next slide, please. 
Um, and just most recently, we had a technical expert panel looking at the model standards for your certification that um, was as a part of the uh, President Biden's unity agenda. Um, and the goal was really to create and publish a set of national standards for peer certification, which is grounded upon best practices happening all across the United States. So what we did was we gathered experts from the field, really with the emphasis on lived experience, and that included both families and caregivers. Um, and that was just held uh, two weeks ago. Um, and, you know, more to come on that. But we will be publishing those model standards in the near future. Next slide, please. And with that, I am going to pass it off to Paulo to talk about our current agenda. Thank you very much, Donna. Uh, appreciate all that history, it's important. Um, you know, I keep a close eye on um, a lot of studies and news articles and reports that go out and anyone who signed up for my LinkedIn page will know. <laughs> put out a lot of information, but two really struck me recently, and Liz and I have had some really discussions about um, these, these most two recent studies. Um, the first was to publish just around the uh, beginning of this, of 2023, and that documented the significant increase, as we've known, in the number of children and young people presenting to emergency rooms for psychiatric reasons and substance use reasons. And the reason that was provided is that families don't have other places in which to bring their young people in crisis. The second thing that study identified was that in emergency rooms, we're also seeing significant increases in the use of medications as restraints, particularly among black adolescent male populations. Second study that really uh, struck my eye was just released this past week by the CDC. And their study that looked at the increasing rate of mental health problems among teenage girls particularly being driven by issues of trauma and sexual assault, in fact, contributing significantly to the mental health troubles that our teenage young women are experiencing. And if these two studies don't speak about the need for us to change our approaches to care delivery system, none do. And the need for us to work towards a system that promotes recovery for people, that people can be resilient and achieve wellness. And that's what our office is all about. I'll say, you know, I identify myself as a, a father and my own uh, daughter, 18 year old, beautiful girl and smart as a Dickens and creative. And going through COVID for her was the hardest time that she ever experienced. And um, when schools went to a virtual environment, um, it was so tough for her that we ha eventually had to move schools she was with, uh, depression and anxiety that she was experiencing and continues to today. But thankfully she got through high school and is now a freshman at college in North Carolina and, and doing well. Um, so the, the importance of recovery, resilience, and wellness is all about what our Office of Recovery is about. Next slide, please. We really believe in value-based leadership and the need for our office to be authentic to the principles of recovery and peer and family support. So in this slide, I won't go through all of these, but these are really the principles that we believe we need to practice on a daily basis with the work that we do both within SAMHSA and within stakeholders across the country, the importance of promoting hope and healing for individuals as central to help promote a recovery-based approach, the importance of holistic care, 
addressing trauma, strength-based, relational, importance of culture in all of its backgrounds. These are things that we feel are fundamental and foundational to the work that we do. Next slide, please. So this is our initial team and uh, really just a wonderful team that we have here. And um, a note, um, uh, just a few things on this slide. Larry Davidson that many of you may know is a former Yale uh, professor and researcher on recovery um, and uh, excited that he's bringing his expertise to bear on our work at recovery. We also have a statistician, and you'll hear in my comments in a moment, uh, the need for us to focus on data and evidence. And then we have a group of folks who are working particularly with each of the centers and act as liaisons with each of the centers to make sure we are promoting recovery-based approaches throughout the portfolio of the agency. We have Liz here, uh, particularly on, on family engagement, and Lupe Mendez also working across our agency, particularly in communications issues, because we recognize it's important for us to be in contact and communicate with everyone across the nation. Next slide, please. Also note that this is just our initial set of staff. We're going to be looking at building on this as well. So Donna mentioned when uh, the Office of Recovery was announced in September 2021 was its initial um, announcement. Um, then for a year, we engaged in a series of discussions and dialogues with recovery leaders, with family members, with peers and others across the country that did culminate in the recovery summit that Donna discussed. And we heard several things that came out of those discussions. And that really led to this initial agenda and goals that you see here. But first, those are those initial things, and I think this is important just to, to kind of set the stage. One was the importance for SAMHSA to take this office as a big tent approach. And what I mean by big tent approach, that means involving mental health, substance, and substance use as it, our focus in recovery. It also means involving not only people in recovery, but family members as critical to the success of this work. And it also means addressing and involving diversity and equity in all of our work. And I'll talk more about that in a moment as well. The other thing that's just important to note about our office is that we were established with a wonderful, due to the wonderful leadership of our Assistant Secretary, Miriam Delphin Rittman, along with Tom Coderre. Um, but this is not an office that's established by our authorizing legislation. What that also means, and this is an important point here, we don't have specific appropriations for the work that we do. So we have to identify resources throughout the agency to carry out the activities we're hoping to do. And in fact, we're doing that right now. So happy to, to share that. At any rate, um, in uh, out of the discussions with stakeholders like yourselves, we identified five initial goals and three cross principles that we believe are important as we begin this work. Inclusion, the importance of nothing about us without us. Also the importance of promoting social inclusion. That means addressing what we've called stigma. Second is equity and the importance of promoting recovery with underserved and underrepresented populations, including people of color, LGBTQI plus populations, rural populations, veterans, <clears throat> as well as young people. Third is peer services. The importance here of expanding peer services, including family support services in every community in this nation. Fourth, social determinants. As Donna mentioned, our pillars of recovery, health, home, purpose, and community, the importance of things like housing, employment, education supports, critical for recovery, and finally, wellness, the goal for people to live longer, healthier, full lives, 
given particularly the high rates of comorbid health conditions and sadly, early mortality that we experience. So I'm gonna talk in a little bit of depth about each of these particular goals on the next slide, please. So first is inclusion. And here, what we recognize is that this office will stand or fall depending on how we engage with the community and with you. And so this event is one means to do that, but we are also looking at getting that involvement and engagement and through many different ways. Those include regional meetings around the country. So working with our regional administrators in the 10 regions across the United States to hear from folks about what our pressing needs. Second is to identify what's working within your communities. And if we have time during our discussion later um, this morning, this afternoon, love to hear what you believe is actually is working in communities, are there innovations that are happening? Third thing we want to do with these regional meetings is provide an opportunity for some training to help folks learn more about SAMHSA, its resources, particularly how to apply for a SAMHSA grants. I feel that's important. We also believe it's important in terms of inclusion, this goal of nothing about us without us to work at home and look at our own backyard, so to speak, at SAMHSA how we can assure our own agency is a model of inclusion. This means how do we involve people with lived experience as staff members in our grants and contracts, in our meetings, in our national advisory councils, and so forth. So we have a formal policy, in fact, that we're working on this right at the moment. We also talk about social inclusion and the need to address the, the stigma, the prejudice, the discrimination that we experienced. Donna mentioned Recovery Month, and we're hoping to build on the 30 plus years of Recovery Month as we move forward. And again, we'd love to get your ideas about what more we can do in that space. Next goal, please, is equity. And again, to increase opportunities for recovery for underserved and under-resourced populations. A couple of things that we are working on here. And if um, I'll note that those include a focus on tribal nations. We know particularly tribal communities have major needs when it comes to mental health and addictions. So we're going to be convening in the next year a tribal recovery summit. Of course, we'll make sure that peers, allies, families are all involved as we convene that particular meeting as well. The other thing we're doing as it relates to equity as an initial activity is developing a compendium of practice-based evidence that's emerged from these various communities to support recovery. And um, here, these are indigenous healing practices and the like that perhaps haven't reached the level of an random controlled trial evidence-based practice, but have emerged organically from communities to support healing. Next slide, please. Is peer services. Again, expanding peer provided services in every community. And, and Donna talked about the work that we're doing in terms of a national model peer specialist standard. We believe this work is, is very important because right now across the states, there's apples and oranges as it relates to state certifications. We were so excited that in the technical expert panel that we convened last week that we had significant family representation. And let me say, family voice was well heard at that meeting. And uh, Linda was able to join us. We were so happy that, uh, that she was able to be with us, but a number of families really made sure that as we develop these standards that family voice and family standards are foremost as we continue with this effort. In addition to the work on peer, a national model peer standard, we have several other pieces of work that are also in the planning stages mostly around financing as it relates to peer services. We just received in December our fiscal year appropriations and Omnibus Appropriations Act. We were hoping it would include a particular set aside for a substance use block grant around recovery supports. 
Instead, Congress uh, chose not to act on that uh, proposal, but what they did act on was a requirement that states, as a condition of the substance use prevention treatment and now recovery block grant, they changed the name, that states will have to report out on the amount of funds that they're providing for recovery support services from the block grant. So that's a step of progress, a, a step in advancement um, that we will be providing guidance to states on in the coming months as well. In addition to um, that work, we also have several other projects that are working on uh, financing that includes an effort that's looking at peer-operated crisis respite programs. And of course, one of SAMHSA's major priorities is uh, 988 and expansion of crisis services as it is for NASHPIT as well. And uh, here, as I noted in the study I cited, the need for alternatives to emergency rooms and psychiatric inpatient care for people in crisis and crisis respite programs are one of such approach. And so we're doing a analysis right now, which is looking at a cost benefit analysis to uh, look at peer operated crisis respite programs vis-a-vis -vis treatment as usual, meaning emergency rooms and inpatient care. We hope to release those findings later this summer. Two other projects that we're working on is looking at the value-based care approaches to recovery support services, as well as looking at the braiding and blending of funds with federal and state to support recovery supports. Next slide, please. Before I talk about social determinants, I would be adverse if I didn't note the ongoing work that we're doing to support families and, and peers. And again, Liz will talk about this, but we continue to support Peer Center of Excellence, Peer on Recovery, um, which is a national technical assistance center to support recovery work. We continue to support statewide family network grants around the country, as well as state consumer peer network grants, along with building communities of recovery and recovery community support program uh, grants um, to support peer activities, along with national consumer Consumer Survivor Technical Assistance Centers. So that work uh, continues. Our fourth goal though is social determinants of health and behavioral health. And this importance of recovery of accessing housing, education, social supports and employment. And a few things that we are working on here, first in terms of housing. We know there's a housing crisis across this country, over a half a million Americans on any given day are living in our streets and shelters. So we are looking at efforts such as recovery housing as a particular model that could help address some of these significant housing needs. The Appropriations Act that I mentioned was that we received um, in December requires us to do additional work in this area that includes issuing a set of best practices guidance as it relates to recovery housing and we're on the way for that work. We're also establishing an interagency work group on recovery housing. So this means working with our colleagues at HUD and the US Interagency Council on Homelessness and others. It also involves a grant program that will be established to expand recovery housing approaches across the country. In addition to recovery housing, supported housing is a model and a program that we've supported in a number of states and communities. Um, when it comes to employment, several things that we're working on here. This includes with the Office of National Drug Control Policy an effort to support, focus on recovery-friendly workplaces. This is a model that's emerged in many states. We've also been supporting supported education efforts and the IPS model. Uh, and providing funds to states to help expand supported employment. We're also working particularly with a focus on transition age youth and supported employment IPS model and that work coming out of our Center for Mental Health Services as well. Other area in terms of social determinants here is noted is education and 
Uh, work that we're looking here to advance is collegiate recovery programs. And these are models that are available in a number of colleges and universities across the country to assist students in recovery, along with recovery high schools. And recovery schools, are, I think, believe there's about 40, 45 recovery high schools now across the United States. And we're looking at ways that we can expand these approaches. We're also looking at convening a dialogue meeting technical expert panel between students in recovery along with college administrators to advance these models fully. Next slide, please. Our final goal is around wellness. And as I noted before, the, the need to address early mortality and comorbid physical health conditions that too often uh, occur along with mental health and addictions. So here we are working on several efforts. The first is to revisit our recovery to practice work. That was efforts that we undertook to expand the training of both behavioral health care providers and primary health care providers to better serve the needs of individuals who experience mental health and addictions. You know, you look at what I cited about emergency rooms and the use of medications uh, as restraints. And that's due in large part because emergency rooms don't have the capacity or knowledge and haven't been trained adequately to serve the needs of people, including youth who are experiencing psychiatric and substance use emergencies. So here we're also updating our work in terms of the model of recovery oriented systems of care. That's a model array of services and supports that helps people on their journeys of recovery. That was developed about 10 years ago, that model. So we're looking to update that to include efforts like harm reduction, for instance, and make it uh, a modern recovery-oriented systems of care. In addition to these five goals, we do have three principles. Next slide, please. And I'll just uh, quickly mention these before turning it over to Liz. We recognize the importance that data and evidence has to further recovery and recovery supports. Last month, SAMHSA released the 2021 findings of our national survey of drug use and health. And that's our, uh, of course, our major data collection effort, epidemiological data collection effort on mental health and addictions. First time ever we reported on the number of Americans who report that they're in recovery. And what that showed, data showed that we released was that 70%, about 70% of all Americans who identify as having had a mental health or substance use issue identify as being in recovery. That translates into, I believe, almost a combined 53 million Americans in recovery. That data alone shows that recovery is real and recovery is possible, and there are many of us. We're looking at further mining of that data to do further analysis to look at, for instance, demographics. Are there any particular age, sex, race issues as it relates to those self-reports of recovery? We're also looking at Correlation. So, for instance, does treatment history, particular treatment histories, correspond with self reports of recovery? Um, and we're doing other analyses that are um, also looking at particular substances and are there higher or lower rates of self reports of recovery as it relates to that. In addition to that work, we are also looking at a measure of recovery in and of itself. And so we believe this is important for both the grant programs that SAMHSA runs to demonstrate effectiveness, but also for the behavioral health field as a whole, as we're moving more and more into outcomes-based care and value-based care approaches, having a measure of recovery will be essential. In addition to that data work, we're also looking at convening a meeting of recovery researchers to identify what are, is currently happening around research on recovery and what more is needed and how we can assist with that. Second principle here is trauma. 
And we know again that trauma is often a precursor. It was certainly for my own mental health and addiction issues. Uh, it's often a precursor to behavioral health problems. It's also important that we recognize that we need to do a better job of developing trauma-informed care approaches. So our work here is both to look at how, first of all, can we work with recovery communities to prevent trauma from occurring in the first place? And our colleagues at the CDC, in fact, are doing work right now in this in helping to look at ways of preventing adverse childhood events. And then how can we work with the recovery community to promote trauma-informed care and reduce things like the use of restraints and seclusions? One of the areas there that we're working on is working with our Department of Education on an important issue I know for families, and that's the use of restraints in public education and the need to develop a much more effective approach across the nation to help reduce and ultimately eliminate the use of those practices that can be so harmful and in fact deadly. That leads to our last principle here is about rights protection and the importance of protecting the civil and human rights of people in recovery and family members. Our work here involves working with the protection and advocacy programs across the states to investigate allegations of abuse and neglect in treatment facilities. It also involves looking at issues such as Olmstead to uh, and ADA protections to assure that people are not institutionalized unnecessarily. This involves working with our colleagues at the Department of Justice as well. Finally, in terms of rights protections, privacy and confidentiality are also critical things that we will focus on in terms of our agenda. So that's our agenda for the Office of Recovery, our five goals and core principles. Now I'll turn it over to Liz to talk about some of our family work. Liz? Thank you, Paolo. Um, next slide, please. In putting the um, slides together for uh, this presentation, I wanted to include a bit of a history of the um, family involvement that has gone back many, many years, even prior to SAMHSA, um, when we were part of NIMH and that's where the uh, Child Adolescent Service System Program, CASP, um, was born in 1992. And in 1984, the research and training centers um, were looking at a project called Families as Allies, and it was to better promote understanding between family members and service providers and encourage family participation in the CASP program and efforts. Um, next slide, please. Wanted to, as we're, there we go. The first federal support for the statewide family network program came in um, 1988 when five statewide family network organizations were funded for $20,000 each in the states of Hawaii, Minnesota, Montana, Virginia, and Wisconsin. And those programs were to begin to uh, do outreach, information, education, and support to families to help end some of the isolation that families were feeling. This initiative was also called the Statewide Parent Organization Demonstration Project. And it was to stimulate and support development of model statewide um, parent organizations that would have the capacity to provide technical assistance, information, support, and networking to parents and parent organizations within their state. And then second, to evaluate um, the conceptualization, implementation, and outcomes of these models. And that work that was done by Portland State um, was continued until the mid 90s. And since then, we have not had an opportunity to uh, do research and or evaluation around um, the family involvement through the statewide family network program. And we're hoping that that will change soon. 
Next, next slide. There we go. Federal funding for the statewide family network organizations was developed in phases. The first one um, was the family organizations uh, were, were, as I said earlier, um, those five that you saw, then those went to three from 1989 to 1990. And then from 90 to 93, there were 15 statewide organizations and they were given a whole $30,000 a year through a fixed price contract um, through the CASP program. It was through these contracts that language was included that the organizations receiving the awards needed to be autonomous and family directed organizations, um, knowing even as far back as then that authentic family lived experiences were important to inform the systems. Next slide, please. From 93 to 96, there were 28 family organizations and they were funded at $50,000 and this was extended then for an additional two years through September of 1998. From 89 to 2001, um, the organizations were provided $60,000 uh, a year, and there were 29 organizations being funded. From 2001 to two 2004, um, we had 42 grantees. That was That is the most that we have um, ever funded. And at that point, the organizations were given $60,000 and were given the opportunity to apply for an additional $10,000 um, if they were looking to provide support to youth and youth organizations in their infancy as they were, as they were being developed. And so the total award was $70,000 and this level of funding has been, has been stable until 2022, when the funding increased to $120,000 a year um, for 13 grantees. Those have now been reissued, and I am no longer um, in the branch that oversees that uh, grant program. So... Um, I'm hoping that we will see soon that we have we are back to 42. I'm keeping my fingers funding of at least 42 grantees. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. The goals for the program continue to to support the development of statewide family organizations in states where a federal award um, has yet to be made, and now also includes the goals of supporting families through education, support, and provision of information to families who live within their state and are raising children with mental health challenges. Um, the Statewide Family Network Program has been funded in all 50 states except the state of South Dakota. We have funding in the District of Columbia and in the territory of Guam. Next slide, please. So on my business, my business card, it says nothing about us without us. And so one of the things that I wanted to share with you are some of the initial ways in which um, the Office of Recovery is making sure that family voice is heard is um, I serve on a an inner federal agency work group for the RAISE Act. And we are waiting to see now what Congress decides to do around appropriation and funding for that. And the RAISE Act is all around caregivers and the support that they need to continue uh, doing the job of um, being everything that there is to the individual across the lifespan who needs a caregiver. So that means families who have young children to families who have older adults living with them or are providing caregiving and support to them. Um, 
We also are the Family and Parent Training Initiative with ACF. Um, right now, we are putting together with ACF a, a series of presentations that we'll be, we will be doing around children in foster care and uh, their mental health needs. The other thing that we're working on is um, Mental Health Awareness Month in May. And in that month, we have Children's Mental Health Week, and SAMHSA has supported in the past um, Children's Mental Health Awareness Day. And so we are busy in the Office of Recovery on all three of those fronts. Um, how are we going to promote um, children, families, and caregivers throughout the entire month of May? How are we going to be focused on Children's Mental Health Week, and we are working with the Federation on doing that. And then there is uh, work being done within CMHS um, and our children's work group around um, Children's Mental Health Awareness Day. So when I talk about the Office of Recovery and Inclusion of Families, I want to give you a short, this is a short list of the um, things that Paulo has um, supported that I participate in. There is the SOAR Expert um, Advisory Committee that I am a part of, and SOAR is working on making sure that everyone who is interested in being trained to submit more complete applications for SSI for children who are eligible, get that training. And there is a SOAR um, administrator in every single state. So here we are um, with a family voice, which has not been there before on that expert advisory panel. Um, we are also looking at, um, I serve on the returning veterans work group and how do we support families who have children who have mental health issues and are within that system that the military and the Veterans Administration supports. And so our voice is also on that, um, on that committee. The other work that we're doing is in the Older Americans work group. Um, and my voice at this point in that work group is focused pretty much on um, grandparents who are raising grandchildren with mental health issues, and how do we make sure that their voice does not get left out of um, the conversations around um, aging Americans. There is also at uh, SAMHSA, the ch children, adolescents, young adults, and family work group, and um, I am a part of that work group. Uh, along with many, many, many others across all of SAMHSA. And we continue to bring the voice of family issues to all of the, the centers across SAMHSA and um, also are doing outreach to organizations and individuals who are supporting that work outside of uh, SAMHSA. And as Paulo said, the Office of Recovery is, is looking at holding regional meetings, and our discussions are still in, in the works about how do we most effectively make those meetings useful for um, everyone in the field who may want to have interaction with the Office of Recovery and share information with us. Um, instead of it being a meeting where we are talking to, we want to hear from. The other thing that I wanted to um, share with you is, and Paula, you're going to have to help me out because it doesn't roll off the top of my tongue, but SAMHSA's ISMIC um, is a committee that was formed um, under the Obama administration and is still continuing to, um, to work on issues of mental health and substance abuse and is currently being revitalized. And the issues of families have come to the top of that group's attention. So 
we are really excited about the prospects of what that holds for the Office of Recovery and the voice of families across the work that they're doing. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is that um, we also are, as Paulo mentioned earlier, very focused on Olmstead. And as I have uh, connected with families in states, asking them uh, whether or not their state's Olmstead uh, work group is um, currently functioning and looking at children's issues. And it's been a great dismay to hear how many states have let their Olmstead work group um, go into kind of a holding pattern. And the hope now is that SAMHSA is going to be able to reinvigorate those Olmstead work groups at the state level. And we want to make sure that Family Voice is going to be at those tables looking at what are the issues that families are concerned about and caregivers are concerned about. The other thing that um, Paulo Paul talked about was looking, taking a new look at the systems of care. And over time, we have seen some um, drift around uh, family voice and the importance of lived experience uh, within systems of care. So that will also be a focus that we have is bringing that focus of family voice in the development of systems of care um, back to a meaningful um, partnership. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, I when I was administering the statewide family network program, I used to say, um, I've never seen a group of people outside of the statewide family networks who could rub two nickels together and get a quarter. Um, I have to say that I am realigning that to the Office of Recovery, where we have taken um, zero money and tried to do the very best that we can to make sure that the message is getting out there. And so I can only tell you that we have very, very critical thinkers within the Office of Recovery that are very um, focused on how do we do this work without, as Paolo says, having the appropriation to go with the office. So um, I don't want to um, take any more time because I'm really anxious to hear what it is that you are interested in. So um, I want to turn my uh, time back to the open discussion. So thank you so much. Oh, I know. One more thing. I'm sorry. Um, in the opening, I what I didn't share with you and was uh, a miss is my my background really is as a mom. Um, I came to this work because my son at age two was diagnosed with um, attention deficit disorder. And um, the crisis at our house was when um, at two years old, um, we discovered um, during the night that his crib was empty. And he had uh, gotten out of his crib. He had uh, learned how to open our front door, even when it was locked, um, and opened the door. And he got out of not only his bed, not only our house, uh, but out of our yard in the middle of the night and was missing. And I can only tell you that the panic that um, struck my heart cannot even be described um, and my whole mission was, what do we have to do to keep this child safe? What do we have to do to make sure that this doesn't happen again? And so I always share, um, my son TJ is the one who took us on Mr. Toad's wild ride through the world of mental health. And um, he went to summer school every year, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. He wanted to graduate early. And so as the rest of his class um, was finishing their senior year, he was in basic training um, at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And being in the Army for him was his dream. And 
Um, in 2003, he was sent to Iraq um, in September. And in November of that year on Thanksgiving Day, um, lost his life as a result of suicide while serving in Iraq. So um, this work is personal. Um, it is lifelong. It is what I wake up thinking about in the morning for my granddaughters. It's what I go to bed at night thinking about um, with those people who I know and love and care about and who don't have a a chair at the table and who don't have a voice in the meeting. So um, my motivation is exactly that, making sure that those people who have not had an opportunity to be heard, get heard across addiction, across mental health, across all of SAMHSA. So thank you all. And I am so looking forward to your questions um, and I will turn it back to Paula. Well, we did have a, a few questions that we wanted to pose to you all, and uh, those are on the on the slide here. Um, and again, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Linda and our colleagues here to help walk us through those. Thanks so much, Paulo, and and just an amazing thanks to all three of you for the history, for the updates and so much for the personal stories. It truly is appreciated. Uh, but let's get, we've got just a few minutes left and let's look at some of these questions. The, let's look at the first one. How can we assist in expanding diverse family involvement in all aspects of behavioral health care? And I'm going to ask you if you, uh, would like to respond to that. If you would put that information in the chat, I would say we could try raising hands, but I don't think I can get a view of everyone on this. So if you have some thoughts about that, if you'll put them in the chat, we will go over them. Robert says we need to provide models for involvement and examples for programs using them. Uh, Paulo, um, Liz, Donna, how does that work with the Office of Recovery? How would that resonate? Yeah, one of the things um, that we are doing is revamping our communications efforts. And um, that includes our uh, website, we have a website on the Office of Recovery. We also have a recovery uh, alert system. We have over... Um, I heard this yesterday, 91,000 people on that recovery alert system. So um, we'll put, let's see if we can uh, work here to put the chat, the, the link in the chat um, before we're done here and encourage everyone to sign up. That's one way folks can find out about opportunities to be involved in the work that we're describing here to come, like regional meetings, et cetera. Now, here's one that I find particularly interesting. Uh, Karen has said that we should consider requiring funding from the block grants to support family peer support. Um, thoughts on that? Is that a possibility? Is that being discussed in any way? Well, that would take a act of Congress, literally. Oh. It would, uh, <laughs> uh, so that's, we can't make that happen ourselves, but of course, stakeholders can. So um, that would be uh, up to you all to assure that that could happen. So that is a, a call to action for all of us who would like to see that happen. All right, let's look at the next question because we have so little time here. Um, are there particular family focused rights related issues that need to be addressed? Um, anyone having problems with these, like parental custody, seclusion, restraint? Um, certainly the one that comes to attention immediately is the problem many families are having with having to relinquish custody of their children to get um, services. Do we have other examples of family-focused rights-related issues? 
Oh, suspension, expulsion of schools. Michelle could not agree more with you. Peer support parents in the schools would help. Long waiting lists, long waiting lists are huge. All right, would it be helpful in building the resiliency of youth and families? What would help with that? We would love some examples. What would help with developing resiliency for families and youth? Yes, the ability to get help is being hindered by changes in the juvenile justice system. That's very true. Support and education for the front line. More inclusion, and I would love to hear from the Office of Recovery on this. We've heard them speak several times about this. More inclusion of youth and family in all aspects of system involvement. Don't create plans for us, include us in the planning. Now, I've heard all three of our speakers uh, speak to this. Other thoughts about how we're going to do this? Okay, and we've got one more question here, and then I'm going to ask if we have questions from the audience. We will try our best to answer a couple of them. And guys, we can make this chat available for everyone uh, when we send out our um, summaries, so please be looking for that. So thoughts on how we can better educate and empower families to assist their loved ones as they journey towards recovery. How might we do that? And I'm going to sort of use Denise's uh, chat to summarize the feelings of families on this. Um, what a breath of fresh air for today's session to hear families will be included moving forward. We know when families are involved, we have better outcomes. We need to offer options to many pathways to recovery. We can no longer serve up the one size fits all approach to let go. Please include incredible fam these incredible family resources that already exist. So often families come through our doors, often ask why we do not know, uh, why we do not know about your services and supports. We found you on Google. There are amazing organizations doing amazing work. Families can be a part of the solution. So I think that is so well said, Denise. I agree with you so much. Um, we are truly running so close to out of time. I'm Linda, going can I just, because uh, one, of, one of the comments here really uh, struck me about, can you tell us right now how families can help their loved ones? I have lived experience in a parent partner and the options are limited. And, um, you know, someone uh, in, 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 in direct need and, you know, the family to family support, both family support specialists and family, um, you know, are there, I think that is one model that we can really expand on in terms of helping other families navigate this, you know, complex Byzantine system of care that we have here. And the answer seems to lie in that experience that others have who have gone through that. Um, how can we do that? Do we have suggestions for that? It would appear we have several suggestions for that, Paula. Yes, I see. 
this this chat is going to be so rich for the Office of Recovery and for all of us, but especially as they are crafting their family voice work. Well, sadly, I must be a timekeeper here. I wish we could continue to do this for a long time, but I think we are about out of time. Um, thank you so much to everyone who participated today. Thank you, Paula, Donna, and Liz for your incredible presentation. I'm going to turn this back over to Kelly and ask everyone to please stay on the line for just a minute because she, needs, she has some valuable information for you. Kelly, it's all yours. Thank you, Linda, and I will piggyback on what you said. Thank you to all our presenters, all, all our presenters today, Paolo, Donna, and Elizabeth. Thank you for sharing your stories and your experience. Um, when we close out today, please stay on so you can fill out a small survey for us, just giving us feedback about today's presentation. We will be sharing the recording link, the PowerPoint presentation, the chat, and a letter of attendance um, to everyone who joined today in an email. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Take care.